The topic that we are addressing today is uh, selling wine, specifically natural wine, in the New York market, in the New York restaurant scene today, and how that's evolved, uh, and what that means both um, from a restaurant and sommelier perspective, as well as from the guest perspective. Um, we have four amazing panelists, so starting over here on my left, your right, with Linda, who's at Rouge Tomat, chef sommelier at Rouge Tomat. Um, by way of New Zealand, Spain, Chicago, Tasmania, what, Denmark, what else am I forgetting? A few Belgium, other, France. Belgium, France, <laughs> yeah, uh, the Maldives, a few other places. Uh, Seb, who is the wine director um, of the Ten Bells, uh, by way of France, and specifically the Jura. Um, and then we have Justin, who is uh, one of the partners at Four Horsemen, um, formerly of Uva, so a, a really specific restaurant or retail site. Um, and then, and then Jorge, who is at um, or who's the wine director of Contra and Wild there. Um, so two great spots in the city, uh, but has been working in the wine scene in New York um, since 1997 at Balthazar selling natural wines since then. So um, I have a few, converse, or a few questions for everyone specifically and, and more generally, and then um, maybe a, will you leave a few, about 10 minutes at the end for any questions that you guys have. Um, if, you, if there's something pressing that you want to know, then raise your hand and, and we'll go from there. Um, so I think it, it could be interesting to start with Seb. Um, Seb, <laughs> Seb came, uh, <laughs> could be interesting to start with Seb. Seb, you, um, you are working in New York at Ten Bells now, but you, uh, actually, let me give you this, this microphone. Um, you worked with a bunch of winemakers um, in the Jura, and that really informed your desire to get closer to wine, and now you do industry nights here in New York, and you bring those winemakers uh, into the restaurant, and you have really started to develop a community around that. So could you talk about um, I guess the importance of, or your, your your view of the importance of those direct relationships and how that impacts your program. Sure. Um, so hi to everybody. <laughs> First of all, um, yeah, my goal, my goal when I started to uh, to do those middle winemakers parties, uh, it's to um, uh, bring or like natural wine is about families, family estates and. Like, a personality, a winemaker, someone that is like giving all his love to, that is dedicated to what he wants to do. It's like a live product, it's something different and we want to like show that personality and show like why this product is uh, the reflection of that exact person. So my goal was really to, put, to bring the people together and to help the winemaker to talk about what he does and um, <coughs> And also to see the impact that his wines have on the market, has uh, have on the public, on the con con uh, cons consumers. Sorry, and uh, and also like, to the consumers to see that person and to have more um, relation to that bottom and that wine. So that came from here. I used to work uh, before the winemakers in the Jura for years and uh, organizing wine fairs with them and. Uh, before that, I was working with um, all the, the, the organic producers of the whole region, and I was trying to put all, all those people together all the time because that's how you help people to understand and to consume differently, and to understand the act, the act of consumption they can have and the power on that. So that was the goal. Can you talk about similarity? I think. All right. So Linda uh, has worked in so many different markets. Can you guys hear okay? Do I need a microphone? Yeah. Um, all right, so next, uh, if I'd like Linda to talk a little bit, um, because you've worked in so many different markets, and one thing that, uh, through conversations with all four of the panelists, um, something that, that is a commonality is that uh, you're all saying it used to be very difficult to sell these wines, whereas now these wines almost sell themselves. And so um, actually each of you could talk a little bit about uh, where, the, where you saw the shift happening, that you have insight into all these different markets, and then, uh, but if, if each of you would just talk a little bit about your experience and what has caused that shift and what uh, is so easy, why, what is resonating with, uh, with consumers today. 
Hmm, I think my experience is a little bit different because each country has been a little bit different in terms of cultural exposure and cultural norms, norms of drinking and consumption. You know, in Europe, a lot of people are drinking young and there's no taboo, whereas in my home country, Canada, the government strictly regulates the alcohol consumption. And so the market there is not terribly interesting. Wine is wine in general and alcohol is very expensive. And you know, what is available in there, the market there was you know, A, very expensive for something that's generally inexpensive in Europe, but also it's stuff that was expensive and uh, something that was really easily accessible and, and an introduction to the market maybe 10, even 15 years ago when I first started drinking. So they're, they're a little behind. Um, but then if I look at a place like Belgium, I think was one of my examples where I was not just in Belgium, I was in Brussels, I was in West Flanders. So. I'm dealing as a foreigner with language and other issues, and then uh, I'm, I'm brought in by the chef to listen, you need to change my wine list, which has only conventional wines, into 100% these kind of wines, basically overnight. When, and there's, when was that? That was in 2011, which at the time in Belgium, I thought was, was gonna be impossible, but actually the accessibility for me to buy wines was very, very easy. Why? And I mean, the wines were already there. They were in the market. I could buy them very easily. I had access to them very easily. It's just a matter of looking. You know, we all know what it's like to buy. You just have to do a little bit of looking, and there it is. In most cases, it's kind of different. But in most cases, it was already there. Uh, but the consumer, the average consumer, was you know, a 60-year-old white Flemish person who either drank Bordeaux or Burgundy or salsa. And so all of a sudden, here I am, I changed this list. And I don't, my songs here might have been Sebastian Ray Folk. How do I explain this kind of thing with some kind of, you know, obviously I needed to find some, some Sauvignon Blanc that was, was easy drinking and juicy and lovely. And uh, for me, it wasn't really about talking about, about anything of more than just, just try this wine and, and I don't think in any of the places that I ever worked, I really talked about anything more than just try the wine and let the wine speak for itself, and then we can have a greater discussion around that, which happened. You know, I was working, I was fortunate enough to be working in restaurants where um, the chef or the philosophy was already following a certain kind of path. You know, we're working with local, we're working with small growers already, so the, the beverage list ended up falling in suit. I felt I didn't have to explain. In some cases, if I did explain, and I think I mentioned this, in, 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 in Spain, I found very early on that in the conversation with my guests, if I talked about organic or witchcraft, they would shut, or organic or biodynamic, sorry, they would call it witchcraft. And uh, I was like, they would, like, they would not listen to me and then I couldn't sell a single thing. Although all of their names are names of witches and, and historical names like that. And if you talk to a farmer, they, they talk about when their grandmother planted and they look at the planets and they look at the weather and they look, well, it's really the same thing. This is not, these are not new planting practices, right? Uh, so if you don't talk about that and you just say, just taste this, it tastes like um, you know, something that they understand, you don't need to talk about the science or, or anything. And it became very easy especially with the food that I was working with. Well, it makes sense with the food. I don't know. It was, there was never any conversation about If you can draw the connection between how the wine tastes and what the guest is eating, then there was no conflict. Yeah. And yeah. I wanted the wine to speak for itself, just like the food speaks for itself. And you know, you think about it. Obviously, if people wanted to have that conversation, then you would. But I realized that starting with it probably wasn't a good idea. Now it's completely different. And of course, in Denmark, people are into it. And you can go to a place and get the craziest wine. And even in New York and the States, you can get some of the crazy, crazy, hypernatural, cloudy, whatever you want. And people will have that conversation. And they can start with that conversation if they look for those wines. But uh, in Paris, in Paris, you would think it's easy. But I've worked, anyone knows Paris at all, I and mean, I don't want to say that to sound like a douchebag, but <laughs> I worked in the 7th at Mont, which is where the Eiffel Tower is, and so you don't find a lot of natural wine places there, and it was 
extremely difficult even for me to have a small girl with champagne. What? You don't have a new rotor, you don't have more to do It's like, I mean, please do people still drink this. <laughs> I don't, there are the ones. And so it's just, sometimes it's about just a small producer. Does that make sense? And this is so good. And does the wine still taste great? Yes. So sort of editing the story based on the audience. Absolutely. Actually, that's a great segue for, uh, for Justin when we were so when Justin and I were speaking a few days ago, one thing that you mentioned that I thought was just so interesting was that uh, now at the Four Horsemen, whereas when you were making the list, you wanted to make sure you had uh, natural wines that weren't going to offend or frighten people. And instead, what uh, you found is that people sort of come and they want the weirdest thing or the thing that is the most boundary pushing. And could you talk a little bit about um, the clientele and, and what you see be interesting? So I guess when, when we wrote the list, when I wrote the list, I'd never written a restaurant list before. I'd done some consulting and stuff like that. But I you know, really wanted to come from a place where people could be happy with what they had and have the wines we loved. But I was really specific, like I really wanted wines with no, no BA and I wanted wines with no bread and I wanted really clean things. And I was really proud. I think we opened with 165 wines. I think we're almost to 400 now. And, um, and what happened was from day one, from like customer one, Pardon me? It's a big budget. What'd you say? It's a big budget. Oh, yes, yes, it's true. So, um, so anyway, what, what happened from, from day one, people were like, do you have anything weirder? Do you have anything, like, a little more fucked up? Like, and, and I was like, oh, yeah, of course. Like, I went through this learning process myself where I learned what mousiness was, and I learned what VA was, and I learned what Brett was, and I could taste those things. But you can't edit somebody's, like, education. And I try not to have like wines that taste terrible or anything like that. The things are still good, but I think it's important to let people go as far out as what they want to go. And I think that, you know, like it's sort of like what Linda was saying. I think it's important, you know, you don't need to like take like your bucket of information and dump it over a customer's head when they walk in the door. I think you can figure out what people want and have a conversation. And if they if they relax and they start to like have a good time, you can keep going. Otherwise. Maybe they want to like they're on a date and they want to hang out and they don't need you to like be like, oh yes, the winemaker's dog is so <laughs> wonderful and blah blah blah. You know, you don't like, they don't really need that. They just you know, stay out of the way and and you know let them let them drink or talk and then you know you develop a relationship over time. I think it's really important. Uh, could you talk about in fact for everyone, um, what wines by the glass are you surprised that are resonating with? Sure. Uh, the thing I'm really surprised by is the popularity of orange wine. Um, our original first GM came from um, Australia, and she was really passionate. Really, was from Tasmania, actually. She was really, really passionate about orange wines. And at that point, like, I sort of, I kind of had a bid there, done that kind of thing. Like, I think we all went through the macerated wines and stuff a few years ago here. And, and I just, I don't know, I just kind of turned them off in my brain. People love orange wine. <laughs> like, it's, it's amazing. And um, so much so that the guys at Maison Premier down the street was told me that they had to put orange wine on the menu because they were having people who were coming before or after our place being like, do you have orange wine? Because we, we always drink it for horsemen. You know, it's really strange. So sometimes we'll have two by the glass. You know, I, that, to me, that to me is the biggest surprise. Like, people really love maceration wine. And it's actually made me fall back in love with some of the wines. And it's made me like really start tasting again in like much more open-minded way. And, um, you know, try to make sure that we have things that don't taste like process. They actually taste like wine. They don't just taste like skin contact. I think that that's really important too. Um, yeah, we've had that at Sambar too. I didn't have an orange wine section when uh, I joined, and people are, are adamant about, about those wines. Um, Jorge. So Jorge, I didn't actually know this, but there was a natural wine scene in New York as far back as 1997, and you've been part of that. Can you talk a little bit about your background as well as the evolution of the natural wine scene in New York? Well, um, these are wines that I just gravitated to a long time ago. And uh, when I had the privilege to work with Jonathan Nasta, he put a beautiful list together at the time when no one had these wines in Soho, so we had Claude Courtois, we had Don and Rebo, uh, we had, you know, Jolie when he was still making wines and not preaching and stuff like that, and, you know, they were actually 
real wines, and you know, I sold this to a Soho crowd, and it was easy because people would just, you know, you live in New York City, so you, I take it for granted. I'm a New Yorker, born and raised, so you know, we live in a special town where people are very open-minded and they want something new. And at the time, that was like one of the biggest restaurant openings that happened in the city in like a decade. So you know, the people that were coming there wanted something new and they were ready for it and they had it and they requested it and you know, anybody that's drank natural wine that's in this room right now, you know that once you taste these wines, you don't go back, you know, you you get an addiction, you, you find out more about what how it's produced, how it's made, and you know, your taste starts to evolve. Anyone that drinks wine like you or Justin, your taste evolves over time. You know, Justin didn't like or oh, wasn't gravitating towards macerated wines, but now he's open. Uh, that's a term that I, I, have, I struggle with. I don't like to see, I'm gonna be straight up, uh, not to see an orange section on a wine because they're, they're, I don't like orange sections. I like, they're white wines. They're wines that were made for thousands of years in this manner and you know, they became something else and it's a white wine that's macerated, you know? So I don't like to use that term orange wines. And I don't understand what Justin is saying that people are coming in requesting these wines. And another thing that bothers me is people that come in to say, I want something weird and I want something, you know, fucked up or whatever. It's like, what do you mean by that? It's like, you know, we had good wines and well made wines, and, you know, this is what it is. Like, what do, you, what do you mean by having a weird wine or something, you know, fucked up or whatever? You know, it's like, there's a lot of little terms that happen amongst natural wines that kind of bother me. But I mean, I never found it very difficult to sell these wines. If they're well made, I think the wines, you know, people drink them, they ingest them, and they really get addicted to them. It was never a problem to sell these wines. And, you know, I'm fortunate enough to be, I worked in places, and, you know, I worked in a place that was in Red Hook called 360, that was a very special restaurant with my friend Arno, that was way in the forefront of any restaurant in New York City. It was, you know, the bar town of, of the United States. And what he did back then, he had a foresight that no one had, and he supported all these growers. And, you know, I was buying cases of Olivier Cousin for $88 a case, you know, for, uh, and, you know, they were amazing wines, and people were so open to this at the time. You know, it was a beautiful thing to see, to see the evolution from working in a top place, Brasserie and Balthazar, and to see it in Red Hook, and people were coming in to drink these wines and to know about these wines. So, you know. What year was that? This was 2003 or 2005. Uh, no, 2008, of course. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so, you know, it was very early on. People were coming in for the wines as well as the food. You know, it was a very special place in this town. And many restaurants were created in that dining room that exists right now. So, from that, you know, philosophy that he had back then. So, you know, I've always been in this world. So, for me, it's not a, a struggle. Just, to sell these wines, to show these wines, to educate people with these wines, it's it's a pure pleasure. And you know, it's nice to see where this town has come now. Um, and it's come much further than any other place in America because it's New York, and this is the number one market. But you know, to see what's happening across the country right now, and in Canada, and Montreal, and you know, in France, how many more places there are, even in France. I mean, this is a a world that I've been involved in, in for over 20 years and it's my world you know so to me it seems like a big world but it's a very very small world you know within france within italy within spain you know and you're seeing all the different changes and it's a beautiful thing it's people going back to the land you know uh, farming it's you know they're farmers you know it's the same difference it's the popularity and the people you know going back to their roots and recognizing something you know as life that's the essence of it, you know? And one thing that um, I think is, at least it, it struck me just looking at, at your respective lists before before today, um, a lot of the wines are natural, of course, but but others aren't necessarily natural. They uh, but they, they respect organic or biodynamic farming. Um, so I would be curious to know um, how, what, what you see as what, what what do people want? What do you enjoy selling most? Do you think it's important to, to signify a difference or sort of take a more holistic approach? Maybe start with Seth. 
support my students and engineers. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, all my use is natural wines, so I don't have necessarily like, by the glass. By the glass, yeah. I mean, by the glass, it's, um, I'm, I'm from the Jura, and I'm from French Mosaic and the Jura. Uh, Jura is my heart region, so uh, I wanted to bring that here too, and I want to like, show those wines as much as I can. So, um, one of my little pleasure is to put Jura wines by the glass, and, um, that was pretty amazing to see how the Pulsa is working by the glass. It's delicious, obviously, because I love it, okay? and it's easy to sell for me because it's just something that I really want to share with people, so it's pretty easy for me. But um, people are like, really like, into, into Pulsa and into like, gold or light, light reds that can be like, a little bit like, different of uh, what they would love to or what they would look into, looking for to. Like I'm talking, I'm thinking about Friday or Saturday nights when it's not necessarily people that know about wine that are just coming from wine. They they want they want to have wine, but they don't necessarily know it's a natural wine bar. They don't necessarily know what pulsa is. They don't necessarily know or drink red uh, chilled, and they just love it. And it's pretty easy. And I said like <coughs> I said pulsa like five cases per week at least pulsa by the glass, and it's super easy. So I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but is it surprising? I don't know. It's just like um, I think when you love something, it's very easy to share that passion, and and you can just talk with the people, and and they will listen to you or no. But they're gonna get their own idea, and usually when you have passion, you can trans transmit that passion. So. Well, of course, at Porsche, I, I mean, I shouldn't really be the one speaking for Porsche, that's, that's my name. But, uh, I mean, the, the restaurant itself follows a specific philosophy from the back of the house all the way to the front and back again, and, and it, it starts with the food, you know, we, we work with great growers, we work with great produce, you know, so it doesn't matter what, I mean, it matters what they do in the farm, but it has to taste good whether it's a, a grain or the chicken or the grapes or the grapes for tequila or the rice for the sake or whatever. Anything else is an extra plus if they work, as long as they work respectfully, both taking care of the earth and their people and, and everything else around them and, and above and below and everything else. You know, that's the most important thing for us. We don't buy because it's just organic. It just happens that everything follows that philosophy. Um, and everything on our wine by the glass is definitely organic, whether it's biodynamic or natural, whatever you want to call it. It's not, but everything definitely by the glass is organic. Not everything on the wine list is, which is something we don't not uh, address specifically. We don't feel it's important. Uh, and people don't ask for that. Uh, the wines by the glass list is is pretty big and ambitious and changes fairly regularly depending on whatever we have available that comes in and out. You know, we've only been open for five weeks, so that has a, there's been a bit change, a bit of change already. Um, and and anything goes. It's nice. Like we can, we're we're selling more than we expected. People people are open to suggestions. They don't just gravitate to a certain area or a certain grape, they don't care. People ask us for recommendations, which is nice, which from my uh, limited understanding exposure to the old Hushnamat, which is what the, which in, was in the Upper East Side, it was a little bit more difficult clientele, which is understandable. There was a little bit more work to actively sell. There's no work, and people just want to come and have a glass of wine and have it delicious, which is nice. And everything else is a bonus, and it's, it's just coincidental that it follows us follows me. And we open the top, which is nice. Are there any wines that you've noticed are difficult to sell? I guess that's a question for everyone. Not natural, not necessarily <coughs> that fit into any box, but are there a sort of type of wine that is harder to sell than you would expect? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, but no. I mean, 
we read like our lines so we can, like you say, if we like, you know, if we've got a passion, we've got a team that's passionate, we're almost the entire team is tasting all the time, and if you like what you're selling and you're proud of what you're selling, and it can be tequila, it can be the tuna tartar, it will sell. I never talk about an active sale even, it's just really it's a discussion, right, with the guests and getting to know and listening, and then, and that just, that's, that's us doing our craft more than anything, yeah. I mean, that sort of like the, to that point too, I think like what we all do is we just don't give anybody a choice, you know? I mean, that's just what we, if there's New York City, there's a million restaurants here. Like what we're doing is we're all really passionate about the way we do it. We've written a list with the kind of wines that we love. We've all been involved in this for a while. We know the producers, some of them personally. We love the wines, we can't wait for them to come. And you know, it's a restaurant next door that has conventional wine, you can go there. It's cool. I mean, but I think that we do a better job, and I think that the wines are better. And I think that, you know, it's true. And I, think I wouldn't be, I wouldn't do this if we couldn't do, sell these wines. It's like, I didn't, I didn't want to follow, I didn't want to start a career in wine. I fell in love with these wines, and then I, you know, unplugged my guitar and went and got a new mic. And it was really important. Another follow-up question for Justin. Um, I believe that the Four Horsemen is the only one of the four restaurants here um, that does not have a team of sommeliers. And so we uh, got to chat a little bit about how you keep your team engaged, and I'd love if you could talk a little bit about that. I feel very bad for the team because essentially what happens, because I don't really work there in the day-to-day, -day, I have a day job, just 50 cases just land on them all the time. They don't know we're coming. And, um, you know, it's, it's rough, and but they figured out a way to make sense of it. And one thing, our, I think it was our GM that came up with it, but everybody picked a region out of a hat, and the, the, the staff is self-trained. They're teaching their own classes, which is really awesome. Um, and it's incredible to see people, you know, sure, maybe you know a lot about the Jura, but you don't know anything about Alsace, and now you have to teach an Alsace class. You know, and I think that that's a great way for everybody. You get a little scared, and then you, and then you really get into it. And I think that that's amazing. The fact that people want to come in and spend the time doing this outside of their, you know, because a lot of people who work in restaurants have other pursuits as well. Everybody's busy, it's New York, everybody's always late to the next thing, you know, and always leaving the other thing early to get to the next thing. And um, to have people really come in and participate is really flattering. And because um, we don't have like a sommelier, you can have a really interesting experience when you come in because you can. You, you're sure that you're in good hands and each, you kind of get to know your servers, you, you know, and you have that moment with them and there's no like, oh man, I went there but the wine person wasn't there and ah, I didn't know they didn't work on Tuesday. You know, we, you, you're in good hands all the time and I think that it's really important. I think it's, it's really fun and, you know, we're really small I mean, we're a tiny restaurant. We have 39 seats and, you know, and like some of them are in really awkward spaces like, and, uh, and so we don't really have like the floor space for just someone to like, Walk around with the test event or whatever. So. I think, you know, Jorge, you recently built two lists after uh, two decades of working with these similar kind of watches. Would you talk about your approach to building the list at both Contra and Wild Air? I guess, Linda, you really built the list at Contra to some degree. So when you came on board, how did you take? How did you either rebuild or take what one of the myth built and then also apply that approach or? with Wilder. Yeah, well, I have, <coughs> Linda has her tastes and I have my taste, so I just changed the list around completely to what I like to drink. And what I want to drink with the foods that those kids were doing and what they're doing. And, uh, and I really pushed it and I developed a, a really wine crowd for Contra. And while there, I went really further in what I wanted to do. And, you know, I would have loved to have the budget to do it all in, at Contra, but I couldn't do it, you know, for whatever, for the reasons, but I did it at while there. So I think, you know, I built two different dynamic lists, both for what Fabian is doing at while there and what Jeremiah is doing at Contra. I did lists that are going with the, with the foods. It's, you can go through many different journeys on that list and, you know, I was able to build it. Linda did something nice, and I just did something further and something on my style. And anybody that knows me that sees that list, they say, oh, I did this list. It's what I want to drink, like what Justin says. It's, it's wines that we want to drink, and we want to eat good food and drink these wines. 
and that's my approach. I just, you know, do what I, I like to do. You know, it's kind of easy. Well, I don't find the glass is surprising to you, but is, is there anything that's sort of a runaway hit that you want to expect? Uh, no, I knew that whatever I put by the glass, it, I mean, it, it all sells equally well. So uh, I'm really happy that to see people in the middle of winter drink rosés, because in this country it's this retarded notion that it's shit wine that makes rosé and you only drink it when the sun is out in between the months of July and August. And you know, there's people that are making beautiful late release rosés that are real wines that are, you know, I have them on the list all year round by the glass and they're just drinking these wines all year round. And the first thing out of my mouth when I go to, to approach a table by the glass, I say rosé and nine out of 10 times they're like, yes, you know, which is great to hear that all year round. That's not, there's no rosé season, it's good wine. And good wine, you drink white, red, rosé, pet mats all year round, champagne, you know, all year round. There's no seasonal wine. You know. So I'm happy to see those wines move the way that they're moving all year round, in particular. I feel like we're going to start seeing that more and more, but it is definitely been a battle yeah. the last few years. Um, maybe we'll open it up to a few questions. Anyone? Yes. Yeah. Um, have any of you ever had to sell wine outside of like major urban epicenters of around food and beverage, like New York or Paris? And if so, did you change your approach to how you talk about food? That's Linda. <laughs> I, so I, when I was in Belgium, it was a small town called Trinoche, mm -hmm. which is a village that doesn't even have a bank machine or a gas station or a movie theater. And so, I mean, I don't, I didn't change my approach because the chef had this vision, and I mean, he's the boss. So I had to follow his vision. We have the same vision. It's, a, it's not any different than any of the lines that I think any of us would have on our lists at this very moment. They're quite similar. It's more the conversation that I have with the guest. <coughs> and then on the other hand, my conversation there, my conversation that I'm having with someone here is different than the conversation that I'm having with someone, someone in London. I mean, I lived, in, I lived in Spain and the restaurant that I visited wasn't even in a village. It was in between two villages, um, population maximum of 5,000. My specialty ended up becoming working in small, isolated villages. <laughs> <laughs> and buying and trying to find good wine, which is actually the greater challenge. It's not selling it, it's trying to find it and buy it. But uh, people, we sometimes have given, or maybe I have sometimes given the consumer less credit than they deserve. And people, people are thirsty and people are looking to explore them. And if I just go in with that, I'm not here to educate you, I'm not here to show you something new. You come to this restaurant for a reason. I've got this list, and we've got this list, and we can have this conversation, and you're thirsty, and we've got wine, and, and perfect. And that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Um, what are your feelings for as a highly allocated wines that are very difficult to get that you can't sell at all at your house because on any given night you would sell for your entire stock? <laughs> that could actually be addressed by everyone and maybe also if you want to add into that the role of the gray market if that factors into the way that you write your lists. I've never worked with anything in the gray market so I can't I'm not the person to speak to it but things that are allocated uh, I don't even bother putting them on the lists for that same reason and if I get six bottles of something I'll mention it to someone that maybe has never had it before and wants to try something and you know, the beautiful thing about what's happening now in New York City is the accessibility to these wines and the price accessibility that, you know, the markups are not that high and, you know, you can charge an arm and a leg for certain things that I've seen in this town, which disgust me, for certain wines that if the grower would see this, it would bother them. And I refuse to do that route because you can easily do it here because people this is a town with a lot of money and people just want it for the status of drinking it and whatever, they'll pay whatever. But, you know, these wines I think should just be sold on a, I don't know, on a level, on an earth level that, you know, you just talk to a person, they want to try these wines, they never had these wines, you can give them the wines. Yes, you can put them on a list and they'll sell, like you said, in a 
and a, a knight, but I think these are things that, I don't know, different people handle it different. You could put the six bottles on the list and charge a, a, a fortune, or you can put the six bottles on the list and charge what they are, or even undercharge them, and you know, just have it off the list to say something here, I have something special, you should try this, and you know, you're gonna make the person's uh, evening. So. And sort of on that note, like, the annoying part of that, keeping things off the list, is the customer that is really entitled. Yeah. And um, I mean, we've, we've actually literally had somebody come in, I'm sure this happened more than once, but you put down like the book in front of them, and they push it aside and they say, so what's not on the list? <laughs> and, you know, without even opening it. And I think that that's ridiculous too, because if, you know, if you, let's get to know each other and see what goes on, but we, we kind of mix it up. I think like a fair amount of our allocated stuff we put on, just because we want people to be able to drink it, but you, you hope you can trust people that they don't go crazy and that like they don't buy like all of your over one like one sitting or whatever. You know? Yeah, um, I don't walk with markets, but I don't know. I just try to walk like uh, with every employer. Like they, the employers are doing a great job and it's great to work with them and just support them as well. Um, so no gray market for me. Um, I do the same margins for every wines, and I don't have a list on the side. Um, same thing. I just like when someone arrives, I'm just like, hey, what, do you, what's do you, what do you have today? Like, yeah, it's not on the list. I'm special. I want to drink something special. Everybody's special. Um, <laughs> it's great. <laughs> and when everything is on the list, everything is at the same price, like the same margins. Everything is special for someone, and just check, have a look. If you have any questions, we can talk about it. We can learn how to know each other and things. But yeah, and if you recognize something that you want to drink and that it's something allocated, I mean, that's great, have fun. I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm gonna be happy if you have fun. It's great. Sometimes I'm just gonna, if I have a case of something, I'm just gonna send maybe six bottles. Wait a few more, more weeks and send and put the other ones on the list. So, like not the same people that are coming and, and drink everything in two days, but that's it. Um, I I communicate a lot on Instagram and Facebook and everything on the social media that are great to like, put people together. And um, I try to post pictures of the things that are coming up in the in the, in the place. So. All the bottles are posted, things that I do by the glass are posted as well, and things. I don't want to do a dis distinction and um, saying like, long law just arrived and you guys can have, can have it, and, and you will not have it because you're not special enough for it. <laughs> don't do it. No. Wine, wine is about love and sharing. The speaker is not bringing those in because I have a yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I have some on the list right now. <laughs> I have some on the list right now if you want. You can, you can have some. <laughs> I don't, I don't think I have anything to add to that. I mean, everything is special and... Do you work with Grey Market at all? We do because we... we not yet, uh, actually. We will, just because it's a restaurant that... You know, we, are, we are the biggest of the four restaurants that are represented, or the five restaurants that are represented here. We are the biggest and there are people that still want some classic photo. And, and they will get it. Uh, eventually, <laughs> we actually don't have any classic window right now. But um, the market is going to be very fair. We don't believe it. There's no way to gouge anybody for any reason. No one wins. No one wins, at least of all the, the consumer in the end. So we want everything to be accessible. Sorry, you had a question? What are you most excited about? Like fall, the leaves change, and I think the 15s 
maybe got like a bit of a bum rap and the people that made lighter, fresher style wines got some real distraction this year. And the wines are like a little more serious and they taste tasted good. I'm actually excited for the no defect stuff that's coming and things like that. This is going to be really good. I would say more than, more about, like more than one region, I would say like Australia, South Africa. Like, um, but not, not just about like one specific region or one specific country, which is really interesting is the new, the, the new wave of uh, young winemakers that are all working together. Uh, they meet each other all the time. They are like thinking about, they are um, sharing all their knowledge, their questions, and they are building uh, their wines and their own styles uh, all, to, like, all together. And it's like a, a new energy that is, uh, that is really positive, I think, and really interesting. So Czech Republic, Australia, and South Africa. I can be in Alsace as well. I can be in all the, in every region. And I started to learn. I started to have that uh, impression when I was in the Jura, and reflecting on there, I thought to reply to the first question. Is like this energy and um, and the power that it can bring when you all work together and you share the same passion, passion, and you want to make the things uh, differently and you make things change. You want to make things change. So are there any producers from the Jura that have not arrived here in the US and you're very excited about and looking forward to seeing in the New York market? Yes, in the Jura and like in all the other regions. Maybe in one or two? From the Jura? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe else. No, I don't know. I mean it's not it's not like I mean he's a young winemaker because he's, he does wine for like four or five years. I would not say he's like young um, it's like mid age, but like Definitely Kenjiro Kagami, but everybody knows him. Dwayne Miroir, everybody knows him. He's not here still. We're still waiting. So maybe, yeah. maybe one day, maybe one day. Yeah. Yeah. I think the advantage that I have of moving around the different markets is that there's always something different in each market that people are talking about. Um, so for me, that there's no one single place that. Um, that speaks to me because it's always a discovery. And if, I, if I've been working in Paris, for example, and, and then I come working in New York where there's everything that's available immediately at my fingertips, it's all very exciting for me. The advantage is that I'm working with someone like Pascaline, who, of course, is the Shannon Whisperer, which is my father. And so it's, for me, it's almost like I'm going back in my education. Now I'm relearning really about. Chanel, but Chanel from the Noir Valley, and all the different intricacies of, of the different appellations within the Noir Valley, for example, which for me personally, in my personal education, was, is fascinating. And that people come for that. That's interesting because, you know, people can come for anything they want. And of course, they come for past, a lot of people come for past me and Chanel, and, and, but people want to explore even, even just the nuances of these different which is interesting to see. I love it. One thing that Sev touched on a little bit was the role of social media, and that's something that I think has taken on a life of its own in the last five or so years. Could each of you talk a little bit about how, if at all, social media, you use it or it impacts your programs? I don't like to use it that much. I'm forced to use it. Uh, I don't <laughs> social media. Uh, but uh, it is what it is. It's it's the wine world is becoming something different because of social media, and it's becoming more like statusy. Uh, but it's the future, I guess. Uh, but it's not really organic. It's you know it's kind of like putting a Craigslist ad out. You know that you got this wine in and stuff like that. But at the same time, it's just you know. It's basically showing you where is what you have. And, yeah. and would you say that it, it results in some people that might not otherwise come to the restaurant on a specific night, they come because they're excited about something? No, it, it, it just results in the people that troll social media that are coming <laughs> to, 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 to drink all the, the fifth lanes that Tim Bells would say. And, 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 and stuff like that. Yeah, I'm coming. I'm coming tonight. <laughs> and, and stuff like that. But, you know, I really don't care too much, you know, about that, and, you know, it's not what I'm about, but, but it's what it is. It's impacted. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. You were nicer about that than the <laughs> So, uh, for us, it works great, to be honest, because um, we do, we have, like, I love mags. Jorge got me obsessed with mags very early, 
Um, he calls them regular sized bottles. <laughs> and um, and the, the thing is, um, we love to open mags just for glass pours and glass specials and stuff like that. And so to put something like that on social media, let people know that like, maybe something really cheap. Like you know, we'll, make, we'll make it far below what you know what a glass corner would be in like a two standard or something like that. And we don't just open one till it's gone, but people will come in and sit at the bar and have you know have that glass and then maybe order a snack or something or maybe spend a little more time or move on to another bottle. And it's it's really effective for us. And I think if we're doing something like an event or a wine dinner or something like that, it's really it's a really easy way to get word out. One thing that's complicated is that a huge amount of your followers don't live in New York City. So it can be often misleading. You're like, you know, you're communicating like, oh, that's so awesome in Australia. Or whatever. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like so so a lot of the time you're not really directly communicating on Instagram <laughs> or Facebook with people who are within the reach of your of your restaurant at all. But it, the, the the ones that you do get to, I mean, it seems to make a difference for us. It's time consuming. <laughs> it's uh it's tiring, it's time-consuming. I'm not a huge fan of that, but I do it a lot. Because, yeah, that's, that's what it is right now. We have to use it. We, it's, it's the easiest way. It's like um, free communication. Like, I don't have any PR. I don't work with PR. Um, I'm the only PR that we have at the place. So that's my job on, in addition, I guess. So I'm learning. I'm still very bad at it. I guess it takes me a lot of time. But yeah, I guess we have to. So it's, it sounds like so far it's impactful for everyone. It's super impactful, definitely. But time consuming. Uh, I don't even have a smartphone. Don't you? You're on Twitter. I'm on laptop. No joke. No. Okay. Uh, I. I Tweet if I think Pascaline or Sarah, if anybody's tweeted something interesting. I feel like I am expected to do that, but I I am A, not in charge of social media for the restaurant. Thank heaven, because I don't know where I am. Um, and uh, yeah, what I find at this moment in time, because the opening of Rouge Tibet was was long overdue and, and long awaited. And I'm just kind of riding the coattails of everything else it's, that's kind of happening with all that. But what happens with is the trolley business. Like people come up to me and they know who I am and they know where I've worked and I have no idea who they are. And they know what I drank yesterday with Pasolino. They know what Pasolino opened and they know where I'm, it's a bit creepy actually. So I, I actually stay away from it. Because you don't have to be involved. But you don't have somebody to be involved. else in the restaurant. Somebody is, but I mean, there's no time. Yeah. I mean, it's not like whoever is in charge of it, I don't know who it is. But, I mean, there's not a lot of tweeting going on. We're working. Let's see. Actually, I'll just add to that. It's always surprising to me that like, sometimes from the Global Fuku account, they'll post it before doing a magnum and selling glasses, and usually that magnum is gone by 7 30. And it's just crazy the power of that communication. Um, any other uh, questions from the audience? Yes, on the stairwell. Hi. Um, often in other wine markets, we talk about certain producers who are classic, we have benchmarks and references. Do you see that as a valuable valuable vocabulary to use for certain natural producers in our market, or do you see that as perpetuating certain producers to sell out? Uh -huh. <laughs> I, I I mean, look, there's, there's, there's important wines in, this, in natural wine. There are benchmark wines, and I think it's it's important to reference those things on your list so that when somebody comes in, they can, they like, maybe if they're not necessarily gonna drink that, but they trust you. I think it builds trust to have sometimes to like have some of those things and they see the wine and they're like, well, okay, this person, this list is cool, but let's take some of the stuff that I don't know. I think that those, those things can push people in other directions. I think it's really beneficial. Um, that's sort of the way I look at it. I don't, I don't think it's bad to have wines that people have heard of. I, I don't think, I'm not really, like, I think for what we do, I'm not in a conflict. I don't want to, like, start a fight. I think it's important for people to, like, come in and, and have a, like, a comfortable kind of experience, I think, by putting wines that are benchmark wines on your list. It, like, it helps people. 